Dr. Marshall, thank you for your time. Um, I would like to address today you, uh, the study that you participated in in defining patient appropriateness for total joint arthroplasty of hip and knee. Uh, could you just uh, tell us uh, why was this study undertaken? Sure. Thanks. For, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to talk to you. Um, I should preface all of this with the fact that uh, this is a team of researchers, uh, and I'm really happy to be a member of that team. And the team has been formed, gosh, I think for 10 years now. Um, so we didn't just start out yesterday. And it's a team that was originally formulated in the context of the Western Canada Waitlist Study. And it involves people from uh, Alberta, from uh, Manitoba, from Toronto, or Ontario, I guess, and also from Nova Scotia. And in, it's a multidisciplinary team of health services researchers and also orthopedic surgeons uh, that are really focused around how do we manage um, wait lists and how do we really think about appropriate care. So that was kind of the, the genesis of this work. And there was a lot of background work that came up to this particular study. And we had uh, historically uh, done some very intensive review of the literature to develop a concept map to figure out what are the components of what we're calling an appropriate decision to have joint replacement. And just to explain, why that's important is because, as you know, there are long wait lists mm -hmm. to getting joint replacement. They're not really improving. And what we're seeing are a few trends, and that is, is that people are getting joint replacements at younger and younger ages. So with that, and also with the, the typical you know, rising cost of health care and the demand for this health care, um, it raises the question of, well, is it appropriate that younger people should be getting joint replacement? Combined with another fact, and that is that the, the severity of the disease when people are getting joint replacement is decreasing. And this isn't observed just in one center or you know, in one place in Canada or whatever. This is actually being observed across Canada and worldwide, actually. There's a whole pattern right. here. So the question is, well, gee, <laughs> um, are those cases actually appropriate? And given that you know, there is a huge demand uh, for these services and we have long wait lists, um, can we somehow identify better who are the appropriate cases um, to be getting joint replacement? Okay. So, so this study identified four uh, uh, criteria for appropriateness for total joint replacement. Uh, the first is determining a demonstrated need for, the, for a new joint. Uh, in your view, what are the primary factors that would indicate a real need for a joint replacement? Right. So in order to answer that, I'll just give you a bit of the process we went through to get sure. there. So it's important to understand that this was coming at uh, multiple perspectives. So we, we um, did research and had discussions with orthopedic surgeons to get their perspectives on what would be a demonstrated need. We also did the same thing with patients mm -hmm. to make sure that we got their input and perspectives on this. So there's a whole series of interviews and focus groups and literature review um, that led into this. And the other thing we did was we also interviewed and spoke with decision makers. So what we were trying to do was triangulate and say, well, there's lots of different views on what appropriateness is, so how can we bring all of that together to create, if you will, a universal definition that considers all those viewpoints? In the end, the decision makers said, well, with respect to appropriateness, it's really the surgeons and the patients that are going to guide the criteria. So if you think about that first criteria, mm -hmm. uh, it's demonstrated need for joint arthroplasty. So there are three factors that we boil this down to. So one is that there's evidence of arthritis on examination of the joint. Okay. okay? Which makes a lot of clinical sense. Yep. The second is that the patient reports that their arthritis cysts 
their symptoms are negatively impacting their quality of life. So you see you get the medical aspect and the patient symptom aspect. And then an appropriate trial of non-surgical intervention has been tried. In other words, surgery is for the end stage of disease when other things aren't working. It's not a first, you know, yeah. first point of, of con recourse um, that I'll just go get it fixed if it's hurting. There are a lot of other things you can do. Yeah. Physical exercise, you know, diet, medications, that sometimes can manage the pain and help people improve their function very well and they don't really need surgery. Bottom line is you really don't want to have surgery until you really need it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we should always uh, try to avoid surgery if we can. So those are the factors that go into the need, demonstrated need. Okay. The leading into that then, what, what indicators might tell rheumatologists that the patient is ready and willing and able to undergo the total joint replacement? Uh, are there specific factors that persuade the doctor um, that it's time to go for, for a total joint replacement? Yeah, well, one of the, there's a couple things that come into play here. Um, a critical factor, which is a component of any assessment, actually, of having surgery, is that the patient's medically stable. Okay. So, of course, the patient does have to have an, an examination and an assessment by the physician to say that they are a, generally you know, a good candidate uh, mm -hmm. for surgery, mm -hmm. um, because we obviously don't want to operate on someone who's ill for other reasons with various comorbidities and may not you know, do well from the surgery simply because of their health condition not because of their need. Okay. Um, so we don't want to endanger anybody. So that's the first thing. Um, and then the other really important aspect of this is having any kind of joint replacement surgery um, does require getting ready. And what, what I mean by that is doing some um, prehab, as we call it, yeah. preparation in terms of rehabilitation, like exercises um, to make your joints strong. Um, and make sure the muscles around those joints are in good shape to support the joint. Yeah. Um, so one, and also, after the surgery, um, there's some pretty uh, hard work basically that people need to do um, to exercise and again yeah. get their their muscles back in shape uh, around the joint. So one of the aspects that uh, needs to be discussed or assessed uh, with the patient and the physician is are they really ready, willing, and able right. to do the necessary work to prepare and also to recover well from the surgery? Um, so those are the kinds of things so, that need to go into that decision. So, so what that would prevent then is, or, or what that would try to forestall, would be somebody who walked in and said, I'm in horrible pain, just just fix this and I'll be good to go. Mm -hmm. So what you're, what you're saying then is that they need to be motivated, they need to be prepared, they need to be physically um, ready to undertake the, the, the prehab and the rehab. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thank you for that. So, okay, so the third criterion is that the patient has realistic expectations. And how, how, how as a doctor, uh, can you go about uh, uh, evaluating what those expectations might be and, and whether or not they're appropriate or, or at an appropriate level of concern or whatever for, for the surgery. Yeah, so this is the third criterion and what it's really getting at is what does the patient expect from the surgery? And one of the things when you talk to patients, and as I said, we did, you know, a lot of qualitative research and interviews around this over, over the years, um, people have very different expectations of what having surgery is going to do. Absolutely, pain and function are key things, obviously, for patients. But there's also a lot of variation in what people want. So I'll give you two different kinds of examples. Okay. Uh, one of the classic examples we talk about is somebody um, who kneels regularly. So for instance, somebody who might be a nun, um, these are real examples, who, who kneels a lot, and that's an important part of that person's life. Mm -hmm. Well. Having a knee replacement isn't really conducive to doing a lot of kneeling. Mm -hmm. um, so if in fact that person's expectation going into the surgery that yes, you'll, you'll fix the pain, but then I can continue to kneel pain-free 
um, regularly every day um, for extended periods of time, that's not a realistic expectation. So the idea of having that criteria in this list is that the patient and the physician, the surgeon, would engage in that dialogue so that the patient understands um, that that isn't necessarily going to be the case after the surgery. Okay. Now another example, so we'll take a different extreme, is sometimes there's a, an expectation from patients that um, if you replace the joint, that you'll be kind of like the bionic man, and uh, you can run marathons, and you'll be better than ever before. Um, that really isn't true either, um, because those joints aren't really made um, to be you know, running marathons. Um, they're really good. The technology is excellent. Um, you know, the surgeries can be hugely successful, but they're not made uh, and designed and capable of, of taking that kind of very intense uh, activity. So if someone thinks that, oh, gee, going into the surgery, I'll be out there doing my, you know, Iron Man, this is not a good, a realistic expectation of what the surgery can do. Yeah, I'm kind of grinning because my, my wife, who is a former uh, uh, national class runner, uh -huh. uh, had a, a knee uh -huh. replacement when she was 50, 57. Okay. But the doctor, you know, she, she asked the doctor, can you give me a running knee? And he said, no, no, you can run, but it won't work. And uh, you know, it'll just wreck it. So she's uh, resigned to the fact that she can never ever run again. But she's very very happy with the knee. So well, I'm glad to hear she's happy yeah, with well, the knee. Really happy. But it was good that they had that conversation. Yeah. Because could you imagine if she went in expecting that, and they hadn't had that conversation ahead of time, and then she come out and she can't do the running that yeah. she was expecting yeah. to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in her case, that uh, you know. Her, her expectations uh, at first were unrealistic, but given, given you know, what, what uh, information she was given, she realized that she couldn't do that. Okay, um, the fourth criteria is that, criterion is that the benefit uh, of the replacement surgery outweighs the risk. Could you talk about two or three or four maybe of the obvious risks involved in uh, in a total joint replacement, say by some, say for somebody who maybe isn't as aware of everything that they need to be aware of. Yeah. So I, the basic idea is any surgery has risks associated mm -hmm. with it. So that's a baseline. People yep. need to understand that having anesthesia, um, you know, has an inherent risk of something going wrong. Yep. Yep. Um, fortunately, it's not too common, but it's not zero. Yeah, I know. So you have to be aware. Um, two is that although the surgeries are um, highly successful, um, you know, most of the time everything's fine, um, the reality is things like um, the way in which the um, joints and the prostheses are placed with respect to the angle mm -hmm. is really important. So sometimes if it's just not quite set exactly the right way, it may be that the surgeon would have to go in and do what they call a revision. Mm -hmm. So they would have to go and kind of adjust it a little bit. Okay. Um, so sometimes that happens as well. So there may be um, a situation where the patient would actually have to go back and have an adjustment of some kind. Um, and the other uh, is just realistically um, that sometimes the um, fit uh, of the joint uh, isn't uh, as good as, as what one might hope. And again, sometimes there might be some clicking or something like that where, the, again, it might need a little bit of adjusting um, beyond it. Um, but I think those are probably uh, the major aspects. Um, they're also probably you've seen in the media, um, depending on the kind of surgery you're getting, um, there's also some technologies called resurfacing uh, that they do. Uh, where they're not replacing both components uh, of the joint. This is in hip. Yep, yep. Um, <laughs> but um, in instances where they do resurfacing, um, sometimes there's a metal on metal um, mm -hmm. uh, prostheses, mm -hmm. and basically um, there have been some, some issues and some concerns uh, and reports uh, that there may be metal ion release into the blood, which could in fact have some risks. Yeah, yeah. So this is a new thing that's um, sort of being watched carefully, um, and, and there's 
there's uh, surveillance on these kinds of things. Um, but that may be a risk too. In, in your mind, having gone through discussion of some of the research that was of the research that was done, is there anything that you wanted to add, or is there anything that you you feel that we didn't cover that you want to make sure that goes on the record on um, in this this video, this this article? Yeah, I think. Um, so this, what we're talking about in terms of this checklist and talk through the different points of it, is really a way um, to engage the surgeon and patient in a conversation and think about some of these aspects of what makes the surgery appropriate in the end so that we can have something that um, really a situation where the benefits to the patient are always going to outweigh the risks using a very broad definition of what that means. Mm -hmm. um, the things we talked about in terms of making sure the expectations are aligned, uh, making sure that they're really ready uh, and willing to undergo the surgery, and of course that they meet all the medical criteria um, that would be suitable for having a surgery. The other thing that I, I do want to mention is that this is based on you know, a whole body of research mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of discussions and interactions so that we're bringing in the various viewpoints of different stakeholders. Yep. And what we've done now is actually we're going to test this empirically. Um, and what I mean by that is we are now embarking um, on a new study uh, that is basically going to be a prospective randomized, uh, it's not randomized, sorry, it's a prospective study um, that's going to look at patients in the clinic and going through all of these criteria mm -hmm. prospectively mm -hmm. and then we're going to follow them out. Okay, mm -hmm. So we're going to identify them when they're coming in for the consult, mm -hmm. then we're going to wait till they have the surgery and then we'll follow them out a year after the surgery to see if patients who are appropriate as mm -hmm. defined by these criteria and measured mm -hmm. along this process, actually have better outcomes. So it's okay. one thing to say, okay, this makes sense uh, in terms of entering into a surgical relationship mm -hmm. or an agreement to go forward mm -hmm. with surgery. It's another to say, do those people actually have, by the numbers, better outcomes? Okay. And then what we want to do, based on those data, is revisit this list and perhaps refine it. Maybe make it simpler. Maybe there are key factors that are absolutely overwhelming in this okay. um, in terms of predicting outcomes. So the short summary of that is now we're looking at can we have a predictive algorithm that will tell us up front how we identify the people who are going to have the best outcomes, both in terms of decreasing pain, increasing function, and satisfaction as a composite okay. outcome measure. And so we have funding uh, through the Canadian Institutes for Health Research for this study. Dr. Hawker and I are co-investigators, uh, co-principal investigators on that um, with a, a multidisciplinary research team. Yep. And uh, we are initiating this uh, in Alberta. Uh, now. Excellent. Well. So, we're excited to uh, look forward to see how we can use that uh, in actual applied decision making uh, you know, and make sure that we're making the best decisions about what are the most appropriate surgical candidates. So